Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A portion of God's Word that we're going to focus on comes from John chapter 12, reading verses 1 to 11. As I read that to you, you're going to notice, like, hey, didn't we kind of just read that from Matthew? Yes. Now you get to hear John's perspective of that same dinner celebration. We hear. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Do not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. This is the word of our Lord. As we get meditation on this, let's pray. Lord, as we consider this dinner celebration, help us to see what you see, that you came for all. Be our Savior tonight and every day and for all people. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, church and meals go together. They always have, haven't they? Eating fruit in the garden with, well, fellowshipping with God. To the Passover feast that year after year the Israelites would get together to celebrate both their deliverance from slavery in Egypt, but also their rescue from death that God provides. And then you have Jesus celebrating that same Passover in our account from John, and on that night, he also institutes a very special supper, a supper we still partake in, where he took bread, he took wine, said, this is my body, this is my blood, given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. We know even in the early church in Acts chapter 2, after Jesus' ascension, after the day of Pentecost, what do they keep doing week after week? They got together, they followed the apostles' teaching, and they also broke bread. They ate together. And no doubt, I'm thinking most of you, if not all of you, have fond memories of, of church, uh, church potlucks or, or cookouts or things like that. There has just always been meals with church. So it should be no surprise that as we walk with Jesus on his final steps, today we see him come to a dinner celebration that, as John tells us, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, and here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Do you know there's actually at least ten separate different accounts in the Gospels about Jesus eating with people? And it's really interesting when you step back and you look at with whom did he eat? Now this guest list, we get three people right off the bat that maybe we're familiar with, maybe we know a little bit. We have Lazarus, and if you know, John chapter 11 is the, is the section that tells us that Lazarus was the, the brother of Mary and Martha. He was dead, and four days later when his body was rotting in the tomb, Jesus just said, Lazarus, come out, and the man came back to life. And here he is, now eating with Jesus, raised from the dead. And, of course, the sisters are there, too. Martha is doing what we've come to expect of Martha. She's serving. And then Mary, not just sitting at Jesus' feet listening this time, but does something very special. And she took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So you got Lazarus, Mary, Martha... Then we find out the disciples are there. One disciple is mentioned specifically by name, Judas Iscariot. And we're told exactly what he would be doing to make sure Jesus would continue on his final steps to the cross. As John says, this is Judas, the one who would later betray him. 
And Judas sees Mary pouring that, that perfume on Jesus' feet, wiping it off with her hair, and he objects. And then John tells us it wasn't a pure motivation that caused the objection. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So you've got Jesus' 12 disciples, you've got Judas there, so you've got a backstabber, you've got a hypocrite, you've got a thief. And then there's other people there. We're told towards the end of the count that there's kind of this, this faceless crowd. People who were gawkers, they wanted to come there because they knew that there was Jesus and Lazarus. I mean, this guy, why wouldn't you want to come see this? You could almost imagine it kind of like a paparazzi crowd. They wanted to get a little glimpse of who is this guy who died and came back to life, and who's the guy who did that? And we don't know if they were gate crashers, if, if they just came in and invited themselves, sat down, started eating, but, but they were there. And then another group of people that come in towards the end, but it's a little questionable. We don't know if they were actually there or not. We hear about the chief priests, the religious leaders, and maybe it was one of the faceless crowd, the paparazzi-like crowd, who had come to them and said, hey, that Jesus and that Lazarus, they're gaining a lot of attention, a lot of followers. Maybe they were there seeing it for themselves, checking it out, or maybe it was just reports. Regardless, Jesus also ate with that same kind of group of people, religious leaders, Pharisees, Sadducees, chief priests, teachers of the law, people who adamantly opposed him and wanted to kill him. He ate with them. And then there's another person who's not mentioned, but we heard about him in, in the Matthew account from the Passion History. It's the host. The guys whose house that they're eating at, and his name is Simon the Leper. Guess what he was known for? <laughs> but the interesting thing is, they're eating at his house, which means he's no longer a leper, even though everybody knew he was. And so you have to kind of wonder, did Jesus heal him? Or did he just, you know, follow the same purification laws that any Israelite, God-fearing Israelite would do and was declared by the priest to be clean from his infectious skin disease and now he's throwing a party because he's no longer in that leper colony but he's back in society, he gets to be back with his friends and his family. So I guess with Simon, you kind of get it unknown. How do you even feel about Jesus? Did he love Jesus? Was he thankful to Jesus? Or was he like, I want the popular guy at my party? Just using Jesus, maybe gain some notoriety. Don't know. When you step back and look at Jesus' guest list for this dinner celebration, it makes me wonder, and I ask myself that question, so now I'm going to let you ask yourself, who do you invite to your dinner parties? I tend to invite people I know I get along with. Sometimes I invite people over because I don't know them. I want to get to know them. And although I haven't done this, I suppose some people, especially if you're throwing like a fundraiser or something like that, you would probably invite just very rich people because you want them to open up their wallets and support your cause, whatever it is. Or maybe you just want to invite the famous because by association, maybe you could get a little bit more of that attention, a little bit more of that limelight. Or maybe you have a compassionate heart that sees the downtrodden, the poor, that, you know what, they, they haven't had a good meal. They could use that. And those are the people I want to invite to my house. I want to take care of them. But would you invite a backstabber? Someone who's known to be a kleptomaniac? Someone who's deceptive, two-faced? Would you invite somebody you know who is actively plotting out your murder? That doesn't make any sense to invite somebody like that, does it? 
Why would, why would we ever do that? Just in practicality's sake, we wouldn't want to bring people into our lives that are going to harm us. And that makes a lot of good sense. But even if we get past the practicality of it and we think about our guest list, let's be honest, most of the time we're inviting the people we want to invest in that we want to share our time and our energy with. The people who are important to us, we're not necessarily inviting everybody. And we realize maybe with our guest list in our head, maybe we show more favoritism than we want to admit. If we go through it, how many times I invited both the rich and the poor? The people who could elevate me and lift me up and the people who could do nothing for me. How many times did I invite the people that I could laugh with and joke with and, and enjoy their company and the people who just make everything awkward? The people who try my patience? How many times do I invite the, the wise sage who I can learn something from? How many times do I invite the drama queen? The person who wants to throw a pity party. Do I invite the married couple? Or the single pregnant mom? Do I invite the grandparents? Or maybe somebody who just marched in a, a pride parade? When I think about the people that I tend to invite, I realize I do not have perfect relationships with everybody. And that I choose to pick and spend my time with the people who are going to enrich me, build me up way more often than I'm willing to spend that time with people who are going to take from me, who are going to steal from me, who are going to use me and lie about me and gossip about me and hate me. I don't want those people in my life. And that's why it's a really good thing to step back and look at this guest list at Jesus' dinner celebration, because you know what? Jesus wasn't like that. Even knowing people's hearts, knowing their very thoughts, that there was no false pretense with Jesus, he knew exactly what was going on. He knew those who hated him. He knew Judas was stealing from the till. He knew that he was a hypocrite. He knew he had false motives when he objected to what Martha, Mary had done. Jesus knew some people just wanted to be around him because maybe they could see something cool and elevate their social status. But when we walk with Jesus on his final steps to this dinner celebration, and look at all the people there, you know what it shows us? Jesus doesn't discriminate when it comes to his guest list. It does not matter who you are, where you've come from, where you are in life, whether you know all sorts of things about him or whether you know nothing about him. He came for you. All of you. Every single last one that Jesus would gladly extend an invitation to be with you. He did this. One, just to have perfect relationships where we know our relationships so often are strained and imperfect and sinfully we decide whether or not people are worth our time and attention. But not Jesus. Time for everyone. Time even for his enemies. Because ultimately, that's the reason he's there. That's what he notes as, as Mary is serving him by, by anointing his feet with that perfume. Although Judas objects, Jesus rightly points out, and I think Mary got this, Mary probably picked it up, because Jesus had not been shy about teaching the fact that he had come here to save all people from their sins, including his enemies, 
including the people who would betray him. As Jesus said, this perfume, it was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. As that fragrance filled the whole house, Jesus gets to make it clear to all the people there, including the faceless crowd, whether or not they're gate crashing, to let them know I'm here for you. I'm taking these final steps so that you can know Without a doubt, I have come for you. It doesn't matter your history. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your motivation. I'm walking this path. I'm living this life so that you can be saved. I'm living perfect relationships with every single person because I know you won't. Because I need to be that perfection that you are not. So that when I give up my life on the cross, when I go to that final place to realize my journey doesn't stop there, but that I rise from the dead to declare, yes, your sins of discrimination, of, of not valuing people as much as I am, they are paid for. Instead, I'm going to clothe you with the perfect relationships I have in this world. So we walk with Jesus to this dinner celebration. We think about that guest list. And we get this amazing truth. Jesus came for everyone. No one excluded. Doesn't matter who they were, where they came from, whether or not they loved or hated Jesus, he came for them. Came to give up his life so that they could share a meal with him. I told you churches and meals go together. Now that we know and are reminded Jesus very purposely ate even with people who hated him. Who are you going to invite to your next dinner party? Who are you going to sit with at the next church potluck? Who's going to be the person you extend an invitation to that they could be joined together just as you are to Christ? To know that it doesn't matter where you came from, it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, but that Jesus brings us all together. Jesus is for all of us. We get to see that as his final steps took him to a dinner celebration. Amen. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.